Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today has been on the show a few times, and you always ask for her to come back because she is so knowledgeable about, about all things musculoskeletal. And today she's going to be talking about back pain, which a lot of people suffer from, and whether or not the food you eat and the movement you do or do not do can impact that. Please welcome back to the show, Eileen Copsitus. I said your name right. Yay. Yes, yes, yes. My husband will give you 10, 10 points. <gasps> well, how have, you, how have you been? Yeah, I'm good. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, you have, the, as we were saying earlier, you know, you have the best audience. I just love connecting and hearing from the people who watch your show. They are awesome, awesome people. So thank you. Um, I agree. We call them the Zoomunity because so many of them show up every day. They kind of take role to see who's there. I love that. Yes. Zoomunity. I love that. Because it's a community um, on Zoom. A lot of, most people do watch in the replay. They don't realize how much fun we have over here in the chat while the show is live. And they get mm -hmm. to ask questions too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm hoping that we'll have time for that. Um, I've got a, a lot of things planned for today and uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, but I'm going to do my best to get it all done in a fairly recent, you know, reasonable amount of time. So people don't feel like they've been fire hosed. So, right. Well, you, you have at least an hour and you're always welcome back. So, okay, perfect. So, so this is what I have planned in the next hour. You're going to learn why back pain diagnoses can be so challenging to determine medically. And, and I think it's going to shock some people how food choices can impact the health of your back, how your hips and your trunk can literally feed your back's ability to move without pain and how you can train your back to be the strongest link in your body. So is everybody ready? Oh, that sounds good. I don't know if you know this, but I was in a very serious accident at the age of 22 and I actually crushed my spine. And boy, that is no fun. Yeah, and I remember the last time you said you have a great PT. So you are a blessed woman because finding a good PT is, is kind of like a needle in a haystack. And I don't mean to sound disrespectful to my profession. Yeah. Right. Well, I had one, but then I moved. So I don't have one up north yet, but I'm going to find one. They oh, exist. Oh. Yes. Yep. Yes. I, I, yes. You will. You will. Say it positive. Yep. All right. So I've got some slides that I want to share with everybody. And um, I think that oh, if I can click my slide open here and then share my screen so everyone can see what I'm talking about here. So everybody can see that. OK, you bet it looks just like your T-shirt. Yes. Yes, I've got my uniform on. Opposite, flip flop the colors there a little bit, but anyhow. So um, the whole goal of this talk is to teach you how food and movement can really improve chronic back pain. The, the The issue is we just need to know how, right? What to do. Most people they know there's something, but they just don't know what, and that's why people tend to contact me and and come to what I do. So this slide this might shock you if you can see here. 70% of people with a diagnosis for low back pain, other exact cause unknown. And, and it's, it's very sad. I mean, you can see here this little beautiful little pie chart here. 27% of the people who, who have low back pain, there's some definitive diagnosis they can give them. Maybe they got spinal stenosis, you know, maybe a disc has been herniated or ruptured, they've got scoliosis, degenerative disc disease and other things, but there's a, there's a specific diagnosis they can give. And then about 3% of people with low back pain, it's a very serious issue. You know, they fractured something, they've got some serious disease going on. But seven out of 10 people with low back pain, the cause is unknown, right? We might have, you know, there, there are some labels people can give, SI dysfunction, piriformis syndrome, sciatica, even just low back pain. I, I've had a lot of people come to the clinic with a diagnosis of low back pain. Right. And then muscle spasms even. But what about things like positional pain? Positional pain means when I sit, I have pain. When I lay on my right side, I have pain. And then there's transitional pain. Transitional pain means whenever I go to stand up from sitting, I have pain. Or whenever I roll over in bed onto my left side, I have pain. Those kind of things. So I want to ask everyone, how often... Have you experienced back pain simply by standing up straight after sitting? I'm guessing quite a few people can say, yeah, more than once, right? So, so my purpose here is to, to teach you, and, and my real goal here is, is I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. My real goal here is 
Because, you know, if I convince you of something, then somebody else can convince you out of it. So my goal here is for you to understand a lot of things about the back, why and how things happen, and then you're going to be armed and dangerous and know what to do about it. So unfortunately, the medical profession, the World Health Organization reports this, at present, low back pain is treated mainly with analgesics, with, with pain meds. And the causes of lower back pain are rarely addressed. This is right off their, their website. Rarely addressed the cause of lower back pain. It's just treated. And my passion, and I've shared this more than once, is being an informed healthcare consumer means making better choices with improved outcomes. So I want you to be very informed by the time we're done here. And, and I want to share just a brief story about how I got started. And it's all because of other people. When I was still in PT school, there was this amazing woman named Mary Chu who came to speak to our class and she talked about manual work and how effective it was at resolving pain in her patients. And so I was intrigued. And after I graduated, I contact her and I said, show me and tell me where I need to go and take this coursework so I don't waste my money and my resources and my time taking coursework that doesn't matter. Because when you graduate from college, you have this entry level knowledge of how to treat your patients. And then the goal is you're going to get continuing education after you graduate. And so I didn't want to waste my money and time on things that didn't work. So she quickly became a good friend, a mentor. And for many years, the first 15 years of my, my profession time, I spent learning as many manual skills and being as effective as I could for my patients. But then I met a man who was trained in something called applied functional science from the Gray Institute. And that opened my eyes to movement and how that could really impact people. I didn't need to put my hands on them. I could teach them how to resolve issues by movement. And it was a beautiful thing. And, and the Gray Institute is founded by a man named Gary Gray. His nickname is the father of function. The man is beyond jaw-droppingly brilliant when it comes to how the body actually functions in movement. And his, his training is phenomenal. If people wanna to go to the Gray Institute, that they can learn a lot, but he, his institute teaches professionals. It doesn't teach the lay person. There's, you know, I, I don't think they would turn a lay person away, but it would be way over their head if they don't have a background in physiology and anatomy and science and all that. And so I decided I was gonna bring this to the general public and teach them how to fix themselves based on what I learned. Now I don't work for the Gray Institute and it's, just, it's not a program they, they created, but I use the knowledge. I mean, I'm certified in applied functional science through them. And, and so that's what I teach. So it brought me to another level, right? Now people aren't depending on me to fix them. I'm teaching them. I love to teach a person to fish. We all know that's a good thing. So there's also some other amazing experts, like there's Sue Hitzman, the creator of the Melt Method. There's Tom Delonzo Baker. He's the creator of Total Motion Release. They have empowered me so I can empower others. And, and their tools are so effective. And, and I just want to say this before we move on. I'm really not all that brilliant. I'm just really gifted at finding brilliant people and learning what they know. And, and so, so that's, what, that's what I want to do. So we're going to talk about back pain. Specifically, about 80% of the population is affected by back pain at some point in time. Eight out of 10 people will have back pain at some point in their life. Sometimes it's pretty severe. Sometimes it's mild to moderate, but eight out of 10. And more than half of the $100 billion spent every year on pain is spent on back pain, $56 billion a year. So why are so many people still experiencing back pain? We're throwing an awful lot of money at it, obviously not working, right? Now, when I first came on your show, when I was first a guest, I taught about the three ways that food impacts chronic pain, or actually three ways food impacts arthritis and chronic pain. I'm going to stick with number one today because I'm going to go into a little more detail. So if people want to go back and watch that other show, they can get the other two. I figured I didn't want to spend that time here. So we're going to talk specifically about fats and impaired circulation. So these are red blood cells on the left here. And you can see they're all kind of single file. These are red blood cells uh, about six to nine hours after a high fat meal. And they remain this way for up to nine to 12 hours. And if you're aware of circulation at all, and I'm going to show you a capillary in a, in a couple of slides here, that only one red blood cell at a time has to go through single file in a capillary to provide the nutrition and the oxygen that it's meant to provide to the cells. And so if they're clumped together, it's going to impair your circulation. And then this, I love this picture. 
this is the picture of this is healthy blood here. This is, you know, the serum and the red blood cells and then or the plasma. I'm sorry, the plasma of the blood and the red blood cells. And then this is a blood sample taken from someone who had had a seriously high fat meal. Doesn't that look like what happens on top of gravy in the refrigerator? I mean, that's pretty disgusting. And that's rolling around in people's blood supply when they eat when they're eating high fat meals and oils and those kind of things. And here's what I was saying I was going to share endothelial cells. Now I know this kind of looks like a cartoon, but you see these, they look like sunny side up yellow eggs. This is kind of looks like a Dr. Seuss picture, right? With the blue yolk. I can think of a Dr. Seuss poem right now. But these are lining all the blood vessels and they have a lot of jobs to do. And I'm going to share uh, some of their jobs in a moment in, in briefly. I don't expect this to be a science course here, but I want you to have a good understanding of why food impacts back pain because you don't want back pain. Nobody does. And so these little endothelial cells line every single one of your blood vessels and they have a lot of jobs to do. And then when it looks to capillary, which is the smallest blood vessel in the body, kind of looks like two people holding hands here, right? With their heads. These are two endothelial cells. So basically a capillary is just one cell wall thick. It's made up of just single endothelial cells. So I've heard experts say that you're only as healthy as your thickest endothelial cell because they have a lot of jobs. And I can hear everybody saying now, well, what do endothelial cells do? I'm gonna tell you. They feed every cell and organ. They provide the nutrition, they provide the blood supply, they, you know, they provide the oxygen, they provide everything via the blood supply. They also regulate your blood flow and your blood pressure. So very, very important there. Nobody wants high blood pressure. They also regulate the size, well, I'm sorry, they regulate the size of your arteries. So if your arteries are, are constricting, getting smaller, it's because your endothelial cells have been damaged. They've been harmed, they can't do their job. They also resist injury by bacteria, viruses, toxins, and pollution. So they've got a lot of really important jobs. They protect us, they maintain a healthy circulatory system, they do a lot. They also manufacture your hormones and your chemical messengers. You can see just how important they are. They balance your inflammation and your anti-inflammation system. And then I believe this is the last one here on their jobs. They balance your clotting systems and your platelets. So who here believes that endothelial cells, they rule? right? When it comes to healthy circulation, they rule. Well, what about unhealthy circulation? Here's a picture of unhealthy circulation. This is, if you think, think of this uh, blood vessel kind of like a, a garden hose, and you've sliced the garden hose, and you're looking inside the garden hose, and this would be the, the wall, you know, the outer wall of the garden hose, so to speak. This is the outer wall of the blood vessel. And here are red blood cells and some white blood cells, and this is what's inside the blood vessel, your blood supply. And these are the endothelial cells. It's looking like they're having a bad day. It looks like they've been ruptured. There's an actual tear in the artery wall. And so now you've got all this plaque builds up. You've got fat deposits. You've got cholesterol that tries to fix the damage. It tries to fix the tears. Cholesterol, you can kind of, I, I liken it, this is my term, I, I've never read it anywhere, but I think of cholesterol as kind of like human spackle. It's going in and it's spackling all the injured areas inside the blood vessels. That's its job. So we have to have cholesterol. The problem is when we have way too much of it in the, in, in the wrong balance, right, of the LDL and the, and the HDL. So, so you really want your endothelial cells healthy. So what does all that have to do with blood supply and back pain? Well, if your endothelial cells are injured and damaged and your blood vessels are shrinking, they're, they're constricting, it's going to limit how much blood gets to the spine. It's going to limit how much blood gets to your discs. 
you can see just how vascular the spine is here. It really requires a lot of blood supply, a healthy blood supply. And the discs really need it as well. The vertebrae, you know, it, there's this pumping mechanism that happens when you're, when you're up and you're moving. You really need a healthy blood supply in order to have a healthy back. And here, this is a, this is a spine that was divided down the middle lengthwise. And you can see nice, healthy discs, nice, healthy vertebrae. These are the discs, these are the vertebrae. Well, here, not so much. These, these discs really don't look so hot. This is disc degeneration. So back in 2015, I attended a conference at a PCRM conference, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And I went specifically because of this woman speaking, and this was the title of her talk, Back Pain and Disc Degeneration as Manifestations of Cardiovascular Disease. The conference itself was on cardiovascular disease, and she was one of the speakers, Lena, Dr. Lena Coppola. I ended up sitting right behind her. I think God had a sense of humor because he knew that's why I was there. And I ended up sitting right behind her. And there's thousands of people at this PCRM conference. I'm sure you've been to at least one of them, right? And, and they're from, oh, the food's amazing at those conferences, by the way. But, uh, but I was fascinated to hear what she had to say. And what did that have to do with cardiovascular disease? So Dr. Coppola has done ex extensive research on the spine and circulation and how that impacts the health of the spine. And so what she found is, this is just one of her studies, and this is back in 1995. So this is not new information, but for some reason, doesn't get posted on the New York Times or the front page of anything, right? It should be. So here we are, the studies, uh, the subjects in this study she saw atherosclerosis, which is cardiovascular disease, by the way, by the age of 10 years old. And by the age of 20, the subject showed 10% advanced blockages. And it was occurring at the opening of the lumbar arteries. And if you're familiar with the word lumbar, that means your low back. And I'm going to show you some pictures of the arteries there and, and what that specifically means. But what she saw was the greater the blockage to the lumbar artery, the greater the disc degeneration was seen. So there seemed to be some kind of an important relationship here. Here's another study. This was the specific lumbar and middle sacral arteries. Your sacrum is, is below your lumbar spine. So this is the blood supply to your lower body, right? Your low back and your, and your pelvis. And this was a big age group, right? From 36 years old to 69 years old. 18% of them showed severe impairment to the circulation of those arteries. And then they assessed the stage of the disc degeneration. And what they saw was disc degeneration increased when they saw advanced atherosclerosis in the abdominal aorta, which is the biggest blood vessel in your body, especially with stenosis of the segmental arteries above and below the disc. So impaired circulation appeared to be directly related to how severe disc degeneration was seen. And most of us think disc degeneration has to do with gravity, old age. We all shrink as we get older. Well, a lot of people shrink because their posture is horrible and their head is forward and their low back is, and their upper back is rounded out. So they lose inches there. But I haven't long, I'm still 5'4". I'm going to be 64 in the fall. I've, I've been 5'4 my whole adult life. So obviously my, my discs are okay. They haven't shrunk, right? So here's another study. I'm only going to do two more. I don't want anybody's eyes to glaze over here, but she's got a lot of them. Here was a study from 16 years old to 89 years old, both men and women. And what was seen was subjects with one or more narrowed arteries were more likely to have suffered from chronic, chronic low back pain during their life than those without the same findings. So she's seeing there appears to be a really strong relationship between the health of the circulation of the lumbar arteries and what happens to experiencing low back pain, as well as seeing damage to you know, the discs and other areas of the body. Here's the last study. Yeah, I mean, I could paper my office walls with the studies she's done, but I'm just showing a few here. These were patients with chronic low back pain without specific findings. So these would be the people that would be on that, that green 70% of that pie chart that you saw in the beginning of this. 
And the prevalence of the occluded or impaired circulation to the lumbar and middle sacral arteries was two and a half times higher. Two and a half times higher, those who had chronic low back pain. So is that why it's other cause unknown? Because it's impaired circulation? Makes you think, right? And then what they also saw was the patients who had above normal LDL cholesterol, they complained of more severe back symptoms and they had more occluded arteries more often than those who had normal LDL cholesterol levels. So there appears to be a relationship here. So let's, let's look at a little bit of the specifics of her work because her work is just fascinating. I know I'm, I'm kind of a geek and a nerd all rolled into one. So I don't know, but to call me a neek or, or a gerd, I don't know but I love this stuff. So here's the lumbar arteries. You've got three main branches and, and you've got the middle sacral artery, right? And here's what her work has determined over the years. And she's published all of this. This has all been published. Three main branches of the lumbar arteries. You've got your posterior body wall, you've got your vertebral body and nerve root and your posterior peritoneum. And you don't have to know any of this stuff, but just know that each one supplies blood to a specific area. So the one for the posterior body wall supplies blood supply to your paraspinal muscles. Para means surrounding. So these are the muscles that surround your spine. And then your subcutaneous skin, tissue. So that's just below your skin, the surface of your skin. And then of course your skin. So we want that to be healthy, right? To that area of the body, the low back. Then we've got the vertebral body and nerve root and that supplies blood to your actual vertebral, the bones, the, those, those blocks that stack and make your spine. We really want that to work well. The nerve roots that come out and the posterior root ganglion, which is a, a specific piece of anatomy. And then we've got the posterior peritoneum, your psoas muscle, which is your hip flexor. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a couple of minutes and your quadratus lumborum muscles. So think about it. If you've got impaired blood supply to any of these areas, what's going to happen to the areas that they supply? It's a big question to ask, right? So if you have impaired circulation to the, the first one we mentioned, the posterior body wall, you will end up with ischemia. That's ischemia is just the, the scientific term for lack of blood supply, right? I, I, I often believe that the medical profession loves to use big words so they can charge more money. I always joked with my, my patients, you know, if you get dizzy when you stand up, we're not going to say you get dizzy. We're going to say you have orthostatic hypotension because we can charge you more money then. <laughs> and I'm not picking on the medical profession about money. But, but it always gets them to laugh. So, so here we are. If you have lack of blood supply or impaired blood supply to the paraspinal muscle, if there's lack, it's gonna die off. You're gonna have pain related to exercise. So who here gets deep pain in their low back when they try to exercise? This may be why, impaired circulation. Failure to remove waste products, accumulation of lactic acid. Who gets a lot of burning in their muscles when they work out and their body just can't handle it? And then muscle atrophy, when muscles literally shrink in size and lose strength. That could be, right? Now, I'm not saying anybody here who experiences these symptoms is, is has impaired circulation. So please don't hear what I'm not saying. This is all about just providing education and information so that you can have some informed conversations with your healthcare practitioners. Uh, here is if you get impaired circulation to the vertebral body and the nerve root, this will impact more than one area, the bone. So if the bone has a decreased blood supply, you can have dull, constant pain. Just never goes away like a toothache. You could have stasis, which is inactivity of the bone. Your bones are really, really active. You've got these, these, these little bone cells um, that, that build bone, and you've got bone cells that clean up the old dead bone, and, and you've got bone cells that do stuff in between. And so it's going to decrease the activity of those bone cells and then or her swelling or edema, and then bone sclerosis and plate sclerosis and disc degeneration. All these things are seen based on her work of many, many years, impaired circulation to that particular branch of the lumbar arteries. And then nerve root lack of blood supply can lead to sciatica pain and radicular pain, which means pain down the leg, okay? Now, obviously you could have impaired circulation to any part of your spine. It could happen at the neck, it can happen at the trunk. We're focusing on the low back today, but think about it. If you've got pain down the arm, is it, you know, we've got miles and miles of blood vessels in our body 
And most of us are concerned about having a heart attack or a stroke, right? We don't want our brain to lose blood. We don't want our heart to lose blood. But what about the rest of the body? If you've got impaired circulation in one spot, you've got impaired circulation everywhere. It, it, it's not going to isolate itself to just one blood vessel. It's going to be happening everywhere because it's the health of the endothelial cells, right? And then the last one, impaired circulation to the posterior peritoneum, lateral back pain. Lateral means on the sides. So it's on either side of your spine in your low back. Might only be on one side versus the other, but could that be impaired circulation? And then pain related to psoas and quadratum lumborum muscle activity. And I'm gonna show you a picture of those muscles in a moment right here. So your psoas muscle, and I'm gonna show you and talk about this in a couple of minutes when we talk about movement and why movement or lack of movement can be the problem and how movement can fix the problem, but this is your psoas, and this is a, a, a muscle that gets severely uh, problematic when we do a lot of sitting, but it can also be problematic if it has an impaired blood supply. And then this is your quadratus lumborum here, and you can see this is attached to the lower rib. These are the floating ribs, so this is rib number 12. It's the bottom one, and it comes down and attaches to the hip, so this is where you're going to get some, you know, that back muscle pain if there's impaired blood supply. So a lot of people are like, well, okay, fats and oils, you know, we're supposed to be consuming those things, right? What about healthy fats? Well, if you've been uh, an audience for Chef AJ here for any amount of time, you know there's no such thing. But I just wanted to cover this with a, just, just one slide. And again, I could paper my office walls with the slide, with the data that proves this. But here's just one. The University of Maryland did a study they dipped bread in olive oil and had the subjects consume it, and they saw reduced dilation in the brachial artery. Dilation is when the artery gets bigger. It's nice and big, and lots of blood can rush through it. Well, guess what? You reduce that, the artery's constricting. It's getting smaller, and you're going to get injury to the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels and impaired nitric oxide production. And that's just one of the things that the endothelial cells too, and I don't even think I put that on the slide because they have so many jobs, you would have been seeing them forever, but they produce nitric oxide and nitric oxide is what makes the blood vessel dilate. And that's how Viagra works for those who suffer with erectile dysfunction. It increases the production of nitric oxide. And there was actually a speaker at that conference back in 2015 who said erectile dysfunction was the canary in the coal mine it let them know that someone literally had cardiovascular disease if they were experiencing erectile dysfunction because it means there's impaired blood flow. And if there's impaired blood flow, that's cardiovascular disease. They just haven't been diagnosed with it yet, all right? And I love this picture uh, for anybody who's ever listened to Dr. Esselstyn, and I'm, I'm thinking he's been a guest on your show, right? Uh, he wrote this beautiful book that I highly recommend you read if you're interested in learning more about circulation and oils and foods. And this is a picture of a person who had very impaired blood flow. This is the widow maker. This is the, the, the lateral. Um, this is one of the major arteries to the heart. This is a coronary artery. So why it's called coronary disease, because it's specifically to the heart, not just the body. You can see how impaired this blood flow is. It's almost pinched off. It's, it's almost closed off here. And then this was after a while of a very healthy diet. Look how open and wide this is. So now that was the one thing I asked Dr. Kopilla because I was sitting behind her and I got to speak with her. And I asked her, had she ever seen any reversal of lumbar artery disease? And she said, no one has ever done the studies. So I would love to see somebody do the studies of disc degeneration literally reversing. Our, you know, the human body is an incredibly designed entity that on a cellular level has an immense ability to heal. So as you can see here, this healed beautifully just from the right foods. So I would love to see what would happen to the lumbar arteries. However, as many of you know, watching this, maybe your family members or your loved ones find, as Margaret Mead said, it's easier to change a man's religion than to change his diet. So you've really got to get focused and pay attention and find the right people and find those teaching truth. And of course, as you all know, Chef AJ is one of them and, and her guests as well. So you're getting lots of education here on that. All right. So now 
I would like to move on to some anatomy. And then I'm, I'm gonna show you some movements. So um, I'm only gonna show a few slides on anatomy. I think I've got three or four, and then, then we're gonna do some movement. We're gonna get up out of the chair. But I wanted you to see the spine itself and understand that even though you know each area here has a different color, and we've given it different names, right? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and then the coccyx or the tailbone. You know, this is your neck, this is your trunk, this is the low back, and this is the pelvis. We've given them different names, but it's all one piece of anatomy. There's no wall in between these. The reason that there's different names is because of the size and shape and orientation of the actual vertebrae themselves. So your cervical vertebrae, of which there are seven, the, the, the angle that they're connected to each other is about a 45 degree angle. And how they're connected to each other is what makes them capable of the movement that they can perform. So your neck, as you're all very well aware, your neck can bend forward, it can bend backward, it can bend sideways right and left, and it can rotate right and left. It's got full motion. And then your thoracic spine, they're angled at about 60 degrees, and it also has a lot of motion in all three planes, uh, you know, forward, back. A lot of people have minimal extension in the upper trunk as they age because their head goes forward. They start to develop that little bit of a dowager's hump. So those people really want to focus on promoting extension in the upper trunk. And then as you get down into lumbar, now there's, they're, they're oriented at about 90 degrees to each other and they're great, big, thick, heavy vertebrae. And their strength is bending forward and backward. They're not real mobile when it comes to rotating or side bending. So this is where many years ago, we all are aware that it was all over the news and everybody was spouting this in the, in the fitness world and whatever. Oh, don't twist when you're exercising. Don't twist, don't rotate, you're gonna hurt your back. And that's because, and it might be because of the Kapanji books, but there's some very, very detailed physiological books that are printed about spine and movement, Kapanji. Um, there's, there's volumes one and two. But they talk about how the lumbar vertebrae really don't have much motion when it comes to rotation and side bending. So somebody got the bright idea, well, gosh, if they can't really rotate, then maybe we shouldn't be twisting. And that's why everybody's hurting their back. Well, that's sort of like, it, it's, it's false logic. It's kind of like you take a, a news, um, a community, and there's all kinds of heart disease. And you look in the community and there's all kinds of telephone poles and you say, oh, the telephone poles must be what's causing the heart disease, right? No, it's not the twisting and the rotating that was injuring the back. It was the other areas of the body that were not rotating that was injuring the back because the other areas are meant to rotate. Your thoracic spine is meant to rotate. Your hips are meant to rotate. And so if you've got lack of rotation in the hips or the trunk, the lumbar spine is going to get yanked. It is not going to be happy camper. It's going to get stressed. Its knickers are going to get in a twist because that's not its job. And it's screaming, okay, you guys up there and you guys down there, do your job. I'm feeling pain here. Stop it, right? So we're going to do just a couple of slides here on some muscle anatomy. I want you all to get this. So who's got buns of steel, all right? I kind of joke, I, I laugh a little bit and I say, you know, if you've got what I, what I lovingly call a pancake butt, then you don't really have a power source and you're at risk of your low back and, and, and other areas of your body not being happy because you really, your body performs best when you have nice, firm gluteus maximus on both sides. So the glute, the maximus, or call them max, Max is the biggest, most powerful muscle in the body. And I want you to notice how the striations here in the muscle are at a diagonal angle. And the reason for that is it performs really, really well in all three planes of motion, which I'm gonna teach you when I start doing some movement here toward the end of this talk. So because of the angle that they're at, they work beautiful when you bend forward, when you bend backward, when you side bend, when you rotate. The, it, they know how to eccentrically load. They know how to just take on the power and, and unload and do what you need to do. And if you struggle to push open a heavy door, 
It's got nothing to do with weak arms and it's got everything to do with a weak power source. So it's really important that we understand that. There's, there's a physics thing where for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when you go to push open a heavy door, some other area of your body has to push with an equal and opposite pressure in the other direction. And that's your feet pushing into the floor and your glutes providing the power so you can do that. And if you've got weak glutes, you're gonna struggle to open a door, right? Now we've got all these deep muscles as well in the, in the, in the butt and they all have a purpose. The piriformis, I didn't, I didn't show you, I'm gonna show you the next slide how the sciatic nerve comes out under that. And that can create that ridiculous pain down the leg. But as you can see here, we really want these muscles to work. You want buns of steel, right? And this isn't about vanity. This isn't about looking good in a pair of yoga pants. This is about living your life without pain and being able to do the things we love to do, like get in and out of a car, go up and down stairs, squat low and get something out from under the kitchen sink, clean out the bottom shelf of the refrigerator, get something, a big heavy something out of the oven, right? Like, like a load of potatoes out of the oven where they'd have been roasted. But, but you want those muscles to work the way they're designed to. And most people aren't training them the way they're designed to. And I'll talk about that when you can see me as a whole body. So I wanted you to see not just Max here. Here's that sciatic nerve I was talking about that comes out underneath the piriformis. And if that piriformis muscle is spasming, it will put pressure on that nerve and you'll get literal pain in the butt, pain down the leg. And what you wanna do is stop the spasm, stop what's going on here. You need to reset the symmetry of those butt muscles, right? And there's a, and I won't get off on a tangent. Maybe I'll come back and I'll, I'll, I'll do one on that. But, but for now, I want you to see hamstrings. So here's your hamstring, right? It's the back of your thigh. You've got a, a, an outside hamstring and an inside or a lateral and a medium. And you can see they attach at the butt bone. So everybody who's sitting right now, you're sitting where your hamstring attaches to that bone. And the hamstring comes down on either side of the knee. It crosses the knee and it controls rotation of the knee when you're walking. A lot of people aren't aware of that. A lot of people think your hamstring, all it does is just, you know, if you're standing and you bend your knee and you try to hit your butt with your foot, everybody thinks that's all the hamstring's designed to do. Or you're laying down on your stomach and you're, you're bending your knee against resistance and you're, you're, you're training your hamstrings to get them nice and big and powerful. Well, guess what? That is not really authentic human motion because do you do those movements any other time in life except on the machine at the gym? No. But what we do do is we walk, we stand up from sitting, we sit from standing, and that's how the hamstring is really designed to function. And I'm going to show you a couple of movements that's going to, going to really teach you some things when, when we're upright. But, but the hamstring, you know, all of our muscles actually perform in the context of the motion that we are doing. It's not about where they attach and what shortens when they contract. It's a whole different ball game. And, and that's what I love about the Gray Institute. That, that's what they teach. A muscle gets longer under tension to control movement once it's begun. And that's really how you want to be trained in your muscles so that you can get out of pain. And so you can age without decline. Nobody wants to end up in a nursing home, right? So here's the last anatomy picture. We've only got a couple more slides here. We're almost done. So here's the front here of the hip. And you can see the psoas major. I showed you that picture a couple slides ago, but this one's a little bit better because it shows some of the other muscles, but it comes down here and attaches to the front of your hip bone. And so, yes, if you're sitting right now and you lift your knee up toward the ceiling, your psoas muscle is getting shorter and helping you to lift that knee. However, you can see the psoas is attached to the lumbar spine. It actually attaches from T12 down to L4. So what happens if your psoas muscles are not performing properly? What if they got their knickers in a twist? I had a, a person contact me who had had back pain since he was a teenager. He was in his 40s. He'd had back pain since he was a teenager. His wife had told him about me. She heard about me through a conference I spoke at. And he contacted me. This man literally could not stand for more than about three or four minutes without having to sit down because it increased his back pain. 
And this had been this way for years. He loved to play golf. He couldn't play golf unless he used a golf cart and he had to sit as often as possible and he paid for it afterward, but he loved to play golf. But usually like the, that day and the day after he was in a lot of pain from playing golf because of all the walking and the upright. So in the very first consult, now this doesn't happen with everyone. So I don't want you to think, you know, I'm like, like a magic wand here, but we figured out based on his three plane assessment that it was his psoas that were locked short and they weren't working properly. So we did some motions to unlock his psoas. And this is the guy on Zoom, right? I, I'm not in the room with him. I'm not touching him. I taught him some movements to unlock his psoas. And then he was, and so now I'm having him stand while we're finishing up the session and we're deciding, you know, when, when I'm going to connect with him again. And I, I'm watching the clock. I said, yeah, I want to talk with you a little bit, but I want you to stay standing and see if you can tolerate standing. Well. Usually three, four minutes was his max. You know, six minutes went by, eight minutes went by, 12 minutes went by. And he's standing there. He's got no pain. All because we released the psoas, even though his pain was in the back. So understanding some of these basic concepts could really help you to figure out what's going on and get you out of pain. And then too much sitting and not enough exercise. A lot of us are very sedentary. We're sitting all the time. Our low back muscles will get tight. Our glutes, as I said, will be weak. Those hip flexors will, will lock short. Abdominals will be weak. Now, just so you know, your core is a lot more than your abdominals. And I'm not going to get off on a tangent here and talk about core, but I do want to tell you, you can't really strengthen your core. You can stabilize your core. You can strengthen your abdominals, but if everything else is off, you haven't strengthened your core. You want to stabilize your core. So that's all I'll say there or I'll, or I'll get going here. So your back can be the strongest link in your body if you feed it authentically from other places, specifically the trunk and the hips. And some real effective training for back pain. You can find it at my private club. I've got a YouTube channel and it's under my name. Um, I know that I have given AJ some links that I'm, I'm thinking are provided for you as well on her page. But these are, this is three plane movement here. This is rotation. This is internal rotation of the right hip. This is external rotation of the right hip. This is flexion. This is extension. This is a deduction. This is a deduction. But this is a way you can assess your entire body from head to toe in 21 minutes. And there's a video that's free on this private club website where you can go on and access that 21 minute video and do your own three plane assessment. And no one ever set a goal to go to a nursing home. Just saying, you know, we sit a lot. We don't take care of ourselves. We have to do things that prevent it from happening. You can't sit on a fence and hope it won't happen to you because it happens by default. I did, I did years in, in nursing home settings. And nobody who was there wanted to be there, ever expected to be there, or planned to be there. It happened by default. So we need to make sure we, we, we work to not have that happen. And that's a big part of my passion is to keep people out of nursing homes. So I do have a three-day back pain challenge coming up. I scheduled it for the 22nd. If you go to this website, you can check, you can register if you'd like to. But I really, really, really want people to live and move without pain and, and have lifelong well-being. That, that's the whole reason I'm on this planet. It's why I take breath because I don't want people to have pain. So that's the end of the slides. And uh, I know we've got, oh, good, good timing. We've got a few minutes left. I'm going to show a few motions and then I'm fine with staying to answer questions. And then AJ, it's up to you, you know, when we have to go. So, oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. So sorry about that. A couple of people actually sent questions in in advance. So we'd love to get to those because they took the time to write. Yes, perfect, perfect. And, I, and I'm in no hurry to go, so anything. Now, um, what I want to do, I want people to be very, very careful because I don't know what's going on in your world and you might not know what's going on in your world, right? Now, the positive thing about the whole circulatory impairment issue, the lumbar artery disease issue, is our bodies will do something called angiogenesis, which is birth of new blood vessels. And what happens when you exercise, 
if your body has impaired circulation to a specific area, it'll try to create new blood vessels to provide blood to that area that you're working. So that's where sometimes exercise can actually resolve pain because you're improving your circulation, even if it's been impaired in other areas. So I wanted to give people that heads up, right? It, it, it's, it's, a kind of, it's a good thing. Now, if you, you know what's going on in your world, or even if you don't, be very careful. I'm gonna show some movements. I'm gonna show some modifications and I wanna make sure nobody hurts themselves checking themselves out, right? So the goal here is, as you, you saw from the slides, your spine, if you remember what I said, your back can be the strongest link in the body if you feed it from other areas of the body. So if I work my trunk, which is from my neck to my waist, and if I work my hips and my pelvis, and I make sure those body parts are working well, guess what? It's gonna feed my low back properly so that I don't experience pain and I can train well without hurting myself. Now there's a lot of specifics and I'm only gonna just do a little introduction here. Three plane motion is bending forward and backward. That's sagittal plane. Frontal plane is sideways, going sideways. And transverse plane is rotating, okay? Now, if you remember me saying, the lumbar spine is really good at flexing forward and extending backward and not so good at the other two. So why would we do those other movements? To make sure the trunk and the hips are working right. So I wanna show you, this is um, it's called a square stance matrix. Anything with the word matrix means that it incorporates all three planes of motion. So there's three movements, but we're doing them to both movements in that plane. So this is called a square stance matrix. And what you do is, hold on, if you've got stability issues, Use, use a chair, not one on wheels if you've got stability issues, but hold on to a chair, hold on to your kitchen counter, hold on to the back of something heavy, maybe stand next to a wall, but make sure you're not going to lose your balance if you've got any stability issues. And the goal here is to bend forward, but let your bottom go backward and reach forward a little, and that's going to load the posterior chain or the back of the body. And what I mean by load let me show you my little, my little monkey here. This was sent to me by somebody, um, a, a couple that I love, wonderful, wonderful people. And if you see this monkey here, if I go to make this longer, th think of this like your muscle. If I push this and, and lengthen it, the longer it gets, the more energy is being built up in that rubber band, right? If I make it really, 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 really long, it's going to go a lot further because it's building up power. It's eccentrically loading. It's getting longer under tension. So when I let it go, I love my monkey, it is noise. So that's what your muscles, that's what you want to do. You want to eccentrically load and unload your muscles so that you're feeding your back from other areas of the body. So when I do this little motion here, what I'm actually doing is loading eccentrically my power source, the max, right? The glutes. So as I reach forward, I'm also loading my trunk. And then when I come up and I do this, guess what I'm loading? The anterior chain or the front of the body, I'm loading the psoas, those hip flexors, and my rectus abdominis. So I'm getting that beautiful load in the front and in the back. So, and this is, this is there's a, a class, that same website I told people to go to to get the three plane assessment. There's actually a free movement class in there that teaches and, and uh, goes into a whole lot of movements and teaches the modifications. So this is, you wanna load the back of the body, you wanna load the front of the body. And then we also wanna do frontal plane. So when your arms are up and your hips go sideways and your body counterbalances, right? Now what you're doing is you're loading your outer hips and you're loading your trunk. So those are what's getting loaded in frontal plane, not your low back. So ideally, this is gonna help feed your back from those two areas of the body that need to work in those planes that are not its strength. If you have a movement that your back doesn't like and you do the movement that it's okay with, it can often restore your ability to do the movement it doesn't like. So what I mean by that is when you do this, 
Say your back doesn't like this one because the front of the hips aren't happy and they're locked short. Just do this one and come up straight. What happens is your body starts to train really well successfully in that sagittal plane and it starts to restore its ability to go backward. You're loading and unloading, loading and unloading. It's this beautiful repetitive kind of a pumping mechanism that happens with the muscles and it starts to restore healthy movement in that plane. Same thing with sideways. If, if, you're, if your low back doesn't like going to one side, but it's okay with the other, then just do the movement that it likes repetitively. And usually within a couple of days even, you'll be able to do both. I've seen that happen countless number of times with people who come into the clinic. And then rotation, same thing. This one, you're going to put your arms out. I kind of say this is sort of like Frankenstein. Anybody remember Chiller Theater when I was little? I loved Chiller Theater and I loved the old Frankenstein movie. But, but you want to put your arms out like this and you're going to turn all the way one way and all the way the other. Now, obviously, that's rotation. And the low back's not real good at rotation. But your trunk and your hips are. So what you want to do is maybe do a small rotation and just start to train those areas of the body that have lost the ability to do it. A lot of people struggle to just turn around and back up their car because they've lost rotation in their thoracic spine. It's not your neck that's the problem, it's your thoracic spine. It tends to stiffen as we get older if we're not doing specific movements to maintain good health there, right? So again, if you can go really good to one way, but it doesn't like the other way, just do the way that it likes and do it repetitively. It will really create that beautiful pumping mechanism, or maybe you just need to make small motions, and then before you know it, you're, you're doing bigger and bigger, but never, never, nunca, I'll say it in Spanish, never, ever, ever do repetitive motion that elicits pain. And I'm gonna tell you why. There's two very important reasons. One, you could be injuring a structure, right? Two, what happens is your brain thinks that you're too stupid to keep from hurting yourself and it tries to figure out how to cheat so that you don't hurt. So now your brain is training you in dysfunction. It's trying to find a different pathway to use so that you don't create the pain. And nobody wants to train in dysfunction. So you do not want repetitive motions to create pain. This is not that no pain, no gain thing. That's a bunch of nonsense. That has to do with bodybuilding and, and, and creating this, you know, really doing this, this massive hypertrophy of muscle bills. That's a whole different ball game. And yeah, if you start using muscles you haven't used, the next day you might be a little sore, but during the movements, there should be no pain. And I'm telling you right now, I've worked with so many people over the years. I teach live classes. I do lots of Zoom online classes. I do, I've been teaching for you know, almost 30 years. I've had people tell me, you know, Eileen, when I finally listened to you and I made sure I didn't hurt, I got better. <laughs> so, so you do not need to hurt when you do these. Please hear me on that one. Okay. All right. So now I want to make sure we've got time for questions. And, uh, and I'm okay. ready, DJ. Uh, oh, this is wonderful. I love what you said about no one ever had a goal about, I want to be in a nursing home. <sighs> mm-hmm. But they end up there. Yep. And I appreciate the slide with the oil because I, I think I'm going to be having Dr. Robert Vogel on the show. And he's the one that did those experiments, the brachial artery tunica test. Oh, I got to watch that one. Yeah, he has it. He, he finally contacted me. I'm so excited. We don't have a date yet, but that would be amazing. So Karen, I think I see, see you watching live. So here's your question. Thanks so much for sending it in, guys. It really helps. She says, since I lost all my weight, and I think she's lost at least 100 pounds, I have a lot of pain with my tailbone. It may be because my chair seat is too deep, so I can't sit up straight. Any suggestions? It also hurts when I'm in a straight back chair. And by the way, like, do you do private Zoom consults with people to figure out what's wrong with I that? I do. I do. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I've actually a couple of people in your audience have contacted me and I've worked with them. That's how I know they're wonderful people because I just, I love them. I almost don't want to, I'm joking. I almost don't want to get them better because I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's a great question. What was her name, Karen? Karen. Karen. Karen, Karen, right? yes. Karen. I feel bad with all the jokes about the Karens now. That's not fair to people who are named Karen. Anyhow, so let me give you just a little ergonomics thing. So depending on your seat, ideally what you want, and now I know you're talking about tailbone and I'll get to that in a minute. 
but sometimes expanding on the topic is more helpful. So a lot of times people want to know, you know, what's the best way to sit, right? Well, you want your hips to be a little bit higher than your knees. You do not want your knees to be level with your hips because as soon as your knees are level with your hips or higher, your low back will round out. And you don't want to round it out low back because if you have a rounded out low back, it's going to put a lot of pressure on your tailbone. So you really want to have a nice lumbar curve. There is no seat that's perfect. My son blessed me with this chair. He, he gave it to me for Christmas. It's like an $800 chair. It, it should do my research for me, AJ. But, but anyhow, there is no chair on the planet that is amazing that will keep you from having pain if you don't get up regularly. Because when you're sitting for any period of time, you're, you're shutting down the muscles. So the power source, I'm sitting on my glutes right now. I'm sitting on my hamstrings, right? They're, they're going to lose power. They're going to, they're going to, they're not firing. They're, they're just getting flaccid over time. And so you've got to get up regularly. And I usually set my cell phone to remind me, especially if I'm doing research or writing. And you want to bend backward. Oftentimes I'll tell people, go ahead and put your hands in your low back, right? Do 10 beautiful back bends and do 10, what I call chair squats, so that your bottom's going back and down and you're loading your glutes. You don't want to do a squat like this because that loads the quads. So we're going for here, right? You do that about every half hour, you'll notice you have almost no pain by the end of the day. But you want to maintain a nice lumbar curve. Now, this chair has a beautiful curve in it. So if I sit back, I've got a nice lumbar curve. But most of us, when we sit for a while, especially if we're on the computer, we do this. So no matter what you've got behind you, you can even use a McKenzie roll you're, you're going to end up rounding out that spine over time. So you want to get up every 20 or 30 minutes, right? And then, um, you know, hard chairs, like you might have a history, and I'm not asking you to tell me your history, but you might have a history of a coccyx fracture. A lot of people have a history even when they were a kid of landing on their tailbone, right? So that area might be tender. But, but my guess is if you're kind of sitting around it out, you're putting a lot of pressure on the tailbone. So that might help you without going into too much more detail. Great. And if she needs more help, she can book a private with you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. This is from Sheba. My thigh strength weakened recently. It's harder to do squats and I feel a bit of strain in hip area when getting up from the floor. Can you recommend any exercises or classes or is a personal assessment needed? So, well, I can give you some general information, and then you can decide what's best for you moving forward, right? As, as I showed, I want people to be informed, and then whatever decision they make is theirs. So it's not so much that your thighs are weak, because remember, the glutes, that's the power source, right? So it's, it's not really the thighs, per se, that weaken. The glutes come down and around to the outside of the thigh, and then the, the hip flexors above your thigh muscles, right? Those, those play a big role in stabilizing you. And so you want to make sure all those things are working right. Typically, that will help your thighs to perform better, depending on what's going on, you know, any history of injury or whatever. But the, the chair squats, those are a beautiful thing. If you really want to build your power source, you want to stand up against something that's very heavy that's not going to move. If you use a chair, put the chair against the wall. You don't want it taking off. But keep your knee back against the surface. So that when you go down into your squat, the knees do not go forward. And I always tell people, think of a game show. If my knees go forward, you hear, eh, right? You want to make sure those knees stay back. Now, if you're able to go way down low because you have the strength, as you can see, my toes are coming up, right? So all the weight's going to be on the back of your heels. So you might lose your, you might get unstable. So hold on to something. If you do this at the kitchen sink, that's perfect with a chair behind you. Hold on to the kitchen sink, keep your knees back against the chair, go as low. You might only be able to go this low and push back up. Don't pull with your arms because the goal is to, to strengthen the power source. Remember, it's getting longer. Remember the monkey? So my power source is getting longer and so are my hamstrings controlling my descent. And then when I create that power because it's longer, I release the power when I come back up. How many of you... How often have you experienced this or seen people you know experience this? They go to sit and because they've got such a weak power source, they get to about here and then they plop, right? How many people plop when they sit? That's a weak power source, 
I used when I worked in the nursing home, it was always be kind to your behind, no plopping, right? But they didn't have the power. I've had people 100 years old in parallel bars doing squats. If you do the right, you won't injure people. Um, you, you just, you have to do them right. And if you've got a knee that's not happy, if you just put one foot forward a little bit, that does a beautiful job. But I really focus on the power source and see if that doesn't make a difference. Um, and then you can go from there. And then that free class too. And, and you know, you might even want to check out my back challenge because I teach more stuff there. Nice. Yeah. I put every single link you gave me, I made it clickable. So there's so much content you've given people, you. articles you've written, summits, uh, free challenges. So all they need to do is look below the video in the show notes, and then they can glean all this wonderful information. Let's see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, okay. There were some, but they get, to, okay, here we go. Can one have a tight CL without so ass, or are they normally tight together? And can a magnesium deficiency cause tight hip flexors? Okay, a tight CL. I'm not quite sure what. Oh well, QL. Sorry, I don't have my oh, glasses. QL. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm making so, up yeah, new. So I'm trying, I'm thinking all the alphabet soup. I was trying to think of what's funny to see. I like to make up yeah. new body parts as we go yeah. along. That's okay. I'm Maybe just... you'll fix some of them. Um, yeah, QL. So that's a quadratus lumborum. Yeah, they they you know. Everything is, can, if you read my book, which I didn't even mention, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if I even gave you a link for that, um, AJ, but I wrote a book called Pain Culprits, and um, I'll show you right here. So, um, and if you join my challenge, I give you the chapter on backs, so you get that in the challenge for free. But everything's connected to everything else. So what happens in the medical world is we isolate a body part, right? They see you as a shoulder walking through the door, they see you as a hip walking through the door, and, and they're only going to focus on that body part. But when you saw when you see anatomy and how everything's connected, and I only showed you a couple of slides, but but everything moves. I mean, your shoulder, everybody beats up the rotator cuff. I'd love to do a show for you on rotator cuff because I'm so sick and tired of everybody wanting to beat up the rotator cuff. It's 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 only four little teeny tiny muscles and it's meant to stabilize the shoulder. It's not your power source for your shoulder. Your shoulder has 18 muscles. Only four of them are the rotator cuff. And they directly impact shoulder function. And then the whole rest of the body indirectly. Your ankle can impact your shoulder. So anyhow, not to get off on a tangent. So, so, so the QL and the psoas, yes, they do work together. But there's a whole lot of other muscles. You've got about 28 muscles that go into the pelvis. And they all impact what's going on. And then there's other areas that really impact. And I'll give you like a 30 second. I don't know how much time we got left. I'll give you like a 30 second thing on, on how impactful it is from the ground up. So everybody can see my foot here, right? So when I go to take a step and I land on my heel, and I'll, I'll say this real basic, the heel bone has to move out, which makes a joint above it rotate down and in, which makes my shin bone and my thigh bone rotate in, which switches on all the muscles back here and allows my trunk to rotate the opposite way. So Imagine if anything's going on in the foot and ankle that doesn't start that whole cascade of movement, that whole chain reaction of movement isn't going to happen if you've got something like a history of an ankle sprain and, and that heel bone doesn't either with dorsiflexion. So, so you really have to be seen as a whole person, as a whole body. When you go to work with somebody, they need to understand authentic human function and how everything's performing head to toe. And it doesn't take long. I can assess somebody's three-plane function in about 20 minutes. So we're not talking hours here, but it gives you the, you, you have a really good roadmap as to the big blocks of the body that aren't working right. Like one hip isn't rotating externally or, or the trunk doesn't like to rotate left or, you know, whatever. You, that now you know where to train, you know what to fix. You're not beating up the victim, which is that muscle that has pain. So, so, um, Sheba, was that her name? So, so Sheba, you know, those hip muscles may not be your problem. It may be something else going on, maybe even on the opposite side of the pelvis. Because I kind of joke with people I work with and I say, you don't have two hips, you've only got one. Because when you work a hip, the other hip is always working. It's always doing the opposite because of that equal and opposite reaction. And sometimes people, and, I, and I'll, I'll explain it this way very simply. If you lay on a bed, and you lift a leg, 
and you have pain, you think it's the leg you lifted that's causing the pain. But because for in order for that leg to lift, the other leg has to push down and create that equal and opposite reaction. So it might be the other leg that's got the problem causing the pain. So you, you got to understand everything's connected to everything else. Wow. So you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, you when you mentioned rotator cuff, like you could do a show on it, because that's something I had for a year and a half before I knew you, obviously. And uh, you could almost do like a show on almost every body part, joint, muscle. I and, could. <laughs> and I'm thinking of changing the show format next year to just doing broadcasts of d- people. Like, on, like what I'm saying is there's so many doctors that are contacting me that want a regular spot monthly that I'm thinking of just doing that. And you would be fabulous to have. Yeah, every- that would be fun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think his people really, really like like your presentations, as do I. So a couple of people are asking about, actually three people have mentioned hip pain, some due to arthritis and some, I guess, just generic, but a lot of people have hip pain. Yeah. So can, that be a show? can we do a hip show? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We can do a hip show. Um, but but the hip, if, if, if you watch my very first talk that I did on the, the uh, food and arthritis and chronic pain, I believe I showed some slides on how, and I might be wrong here because I do a lot of teaching and a lot of talks and a lot of slides, but there, there's what they found is there's not a real direct relationship between arthritis and hip pain. So what they found is there's a lot of people who, when they do an x-ray image, they see arthritis, but they don't experience pain and then vice versa. They, they experience pain, but they don't see arthritis. So what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that, you know, arthritis can't be causing the pain, but what it does mean is a lot of the times people are told the reason they're experiencing their pain is because of what they see on image. What if it's not? I cannot tell you how many people I've worked with who came in with a diagnosis of arthritis, hip OA, knee OA, whatever, and we were able to restore function in the movement of those muscles and they no longer had pain in those areas, I didn't wave a magic wand over their arthritis, right? So, yeah. And and if there's arthritis, again, that first show, food is a huge inflammatory factor. And, and, you know, the the Stanford University School of Medicine is the one that did the study to see what causes joint damage. And they said it was not wear and tear. It was not age. It was not compression. It was inflammation, chronic inflammation. And food is the most offending factor. Yeah, interesting. So here's an interesting question from Rebecca. What are your thoughts about yoga poses like when people put their legs behind their head? Good, bad? It's so funny. You're going to laugh, AJ, because I know you go to yoga, but I'd rather chew off my arm than do yoga. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, I don't go to yoga anymore. I haven't been to a class since the pandemic, but I do some stretches on my own. And I think that my problems are my my doctor said, well, you're too flexible. That's what your problem is. I thought that was a good thing. There are some people who are kind of what I call loosey goosey, right? You're kind of hyper flexible and you do need to focus more on stability work. Right. And then there are those who are not, they're really kind of stiff. And those people want to work a little bit more on flexibility work. There's nothing wrong with yoga. There's all kinds of data that shows yoga has gotten people out of pain. I mean, yoga can be a beautiful thing, but I've also worked with a whole bunch of people who really injured themselves in a yoga class. And there's two reasons for that. One, either the instructor really didn't know what they were doing and didn't teach good modifications for people who were limited and or the person was too embarrassed to not do the move everybody else was doing. And even though they knew they shouldn't do it and it hurt, they did it anyway because they didn't want to stand out in the class. So that's not the instructor's fault. That's the person, right? So um, when, when it comes to yoga, I, I like I said, it's a beautiful thing. I don't do it. I don't care for it. And, and there was one expert that I love, Jack Medina. He was a, a head training coach for Kathy Rigby's summer training camp He's from the past. And uh, his favorite saying was the most important exercise in the world is the one that you'll do. So I don't force myself to do exercises I don't care for doing. And I, fa- I tried yoga a couple of times. I don't like to s- statically sit in some pose. It just doesn't do a thing for me. It doesn't float my boat. So I like to move. I like to walk. I like to do weight training. I, I recently bought a rebounder. I'm having a lot of fun on that. But, um, but yoga, you have to be very careful that you're not doing moves your body's not capable of doing. And, and there's, I don't know how, how think about the movements you're doing. Are they functional movements that you would need to do in your daily life? That's really the number one thing to think about. 
right? Do you need to be able to put your ankles behind your neck? I don't know. <laughs> you know if you're in a circus, maybe. Uh, you know. Yeah, you're funny. So, yeah. I love the I love your attitude because the way you feel about yoga is the way I feel about strength training. And you know, I I think it's so important that it, just because you can't do every type of exercise doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything. And and do if you can do something, at least start there. Like it's like with vegetables. If you hate them all, eat the one you hate the least first. Yes, yes. And I've taught I've taught that to people when I've tried to get them to eat healthier. Give me a list of the vegetables you like, yeah. and I'll give you some recipes. <laughs> yeah, you are terrific. We as soon as we get off, we let's let's schedule you back for as many times as as you're available once Perfect. a month. I would, I would love, love to it. have you back. Yeah, you are yeah. just. So I just wish. God, I wish I. Where do you live? If I may ask. I'm in upstate New York. Okay, it's a little far for me to come for an in person appointment, but that, yeah. that's amazing. Well, wow. I have daughters in Arizona, so we could maybe meet. Yeah, you are <laughs> so good. Yeah, you can do like we could do a live session of like you know all the things that are wrong with Chef AJ. You know, you know, so funny <laughs> because, because um, when I broke my back, it, it 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 caused me to have a little bit of a kyphosis, and it, there's just I mean, other than surgery, there's nothing I can do. And people that are anti vegan will watch this and say, well, it's because she's vegan. No, it's because I crushed two vertebrae in my spine when I was 22, and you know so anyway you, I bet you could work wonders with me I'll bet there's a lot you could do yep, yeah absolutely the human body is just incredible at what it yeah. can do yeah I just love your passion for this and I love that you're doing it on a 100% plant exclusive diet yes yes me too uh, you know there's, there's a lot of vegan bodybuilders out there absolutely did you know that the was it 2019 the 2019 world's strongest man was a vegan is that Patrick Barboobian? Uh, that sounds right. Yes. Yeah, I, I met him. He he really is strong. Well, thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. And the thing about, that's so great about your talks is they're here on YouTube for free. People can watch them over and over and glean all your knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, AJ. Right. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much, Eileen. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Una Dungan, and she's going to be talking about how we can ditch the diet.